received yesterday with a wonderful visit around the campus. Uh, we had a nice reception and dinner and some wonderful discussion last night. Uh, comments, uh, Chancellor Loki, you this morning at breakfast, and then another great session of lunch. Very much appreciate the hospitality uh, that you and your staff, that your team, um, has have extended to us. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Uh, this morning, um, we welcome our newest member, Dr. Trent Ingvers, um, as our faculty member. Uh, he'll be serving with us until 2021. At the University of Southern Indiana, Trent serves as the Associate Professor of Political Science and Public Administration and the Director of the uh, Masters of Public Administration program. He previously taught at the University of Notre Dame, Mendoza College of Business, Indiana University School of Public and Environmental Affairs, uh, DePaul University uh, School of Public Service, and the University of uh, Missouri Truman School of Public Affairs. He was a 2015-2016 USA Foundation Award winner for excellence in teaching. He's a former Peace Corps volunteer and frequently serves as a nonprofit consultant. Trent holds degrees from Xavier University, the University of Maryland, University of Missouri, and Indiana University. I'm exhausted. Yeah, I, 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 uh, but we're welcome to the commission. We're delighted to have you. Thank you. I have the great pleasure um, of pro proposing this year's officer slate. Each year in August, the commission elects a new slate of officers. Uh, this slate was created by a nominating committee consisting of one member per class. Uh, the 2019-2020 officer slate, which is perhaps the most august body that is soon to be elected, would be Al Hubbard as the chair, Beverly Pitts as the vice chair, and Mike Alley as the secretary. May I have a motion? Second. Motion and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, I um, uh, am passing the gavel, although you can see Al already took it. And, and <laughs> <laughs> nice table. But before I exit, I just have a couple of, just a very short couple of comments. One, I'm not sure how many years I've been on the commission, but uh, I don't think that I have ever uh, served uh, with a finer executive than um, our commissioner for higher education, Teresa Lovers, and who is really uh, not nationally recognized for the expertise, the knowledge, and the experience that she brings to her role. One of her great assets is the remarkable staff that she continues to bring, field, and keep and uh, this staff never disappoints. Uh, it is an incredibly fine group of people to work with. So it's been very easy um, uh, to be chair, but it's also probably been the most enjoyable role that I've had on any organization I'm involved with. So thank you very much, Teresa. And with that, Mr. Chairman, you have the floor. Thank you.
gauge tire or some tire, and they, they repair it for nothing. <laughs> Discounts higher in Maribel. Okay, well, so I guess I should get started. Let me announce the, uh, the, the, the new comm committee appointments and reappointments. John Costas is stepping down as chair of the Budget and Product County Committee, and it's going to be replaced by Chris Lamo. Uh, but we'll continue to serve on the committee. I'm just delighted to report. And uh, with the departure of Kathy Parkinson, as we talked about this morning, Mike Alley is going to chair the Student Success and Completion Committee. And Beverly Pitts has agreed to continue as chair of the Academic Affairs and Quality Committee. Uh, a handout reflecting these changes is, is included in your packet of information. <coughs> I'll now turn to the commissioner for her report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I have to begin by just extending my thanks to Chris Lamo for his service as chair. Um, he's been just a, a great leader, a great counselor for the work we've done, always intellectually curious, but kept us focused on doing really important things. And I'm delighted that you're going to continue in this new role um, in terms of chairing the Budget and Productivity Committee. Uh, I appreciate the work that you've done with John and serving in that role, and I don't continue to be there as well. And new, a new great slate of officers. Is intellectually curious. If there's really anybody who's intellectually curious, it's this guy. <laughs> so, um, uh, and he asks really important questions and cares so much about the issues before us and, the, and really always reminds us about the students we serve. So I think that's going to be really important as well. Um, I want to. Welcome, as everybody else has, our new faculty member. Uh, it's a delight to have you join us. I've had a chance to spend a little time with him. He's hit the ground running, uh, and is, as all of our faculty representatives have done, is wanting to make our work so much better, uh, reminding us again of the complexity of this enterprise that we uh, are charged to coordinate. So thank you for your willingness to serve. I have to thank Lisa for making the effort to be here. Lisa Hirschman, who serves as a member of our commission, uh, most of you in the audience probably don't know, but is, uh, has been nominated by the president for the third ranking position at the Department of Defense uh, and will be uh, going before the hearing in, later in September. Um, you know, we think we deal with a lot of money. I don't even I can't even begin to imagine in this procurement kind of man. What is the exact role, Lisa, that is exactly called in your position? Uh, Chief Management Officer. Chief Management Officer of the Pentagon and everything related. So. Um, <laughs> We appreciate your effort to be here with us today. We know it's not always easy. Um, I too want to call out a thank you to the Chancellor, to Chancellor Lowe. I learned yesterday what most of you in the audience know is that he has announced that um, next year, uh, I think end of June or July, will be at the conclusion of his career as Chancellor, although he will remain associated in a teaching kind of capacity in many other ways as well. That kind of the continuity of service for a decade makes a huge difference in a, all organizations, but has really been so important to the leadership of here, so of this place. So thank you so much and for your gracious hospitality greeting us here today. Um, I'm reminded that with the changing of the guard at the commission level and the officers, that we also do uh, have changes that take place at the commission. Our good fortune is that, as was indicated by Chris, we're able to attract people who are really mission-driven to the institutions of, of higher education, and often they leave us to go to someplace else, but the good fortune that we have is they often leave to stay in higher education. And uh, I'm announcing today that Zach Smith, who's been with us for over four years, has accepted a position with Indiana University in the Office of, of Vice President for Government Relations. Um, and as I indicated in my email to the staff, um, uh, IU is indeed fortunate to have his leadership that we've been able to have for the last four years. And I'm really pleased that he's chosen to continue his career in higher education, as is often the case. So he's been a great leader for us, um, and we will miss him in this role, but look forward to serving you in another role. So if you'll join me in thanking Zach. Recently, 
become engaged, and well, we found out she didn't tell anybody. <laughs> and so I walked into her office the other day, and she mentioned it to me, and I sort of screamed. And, and I think I let it out so that everybody found out. But she's kind of just letting people discover her ring. But if you have a chance, congratulate Alicia as well um, for this new life change that's taking place for her. Uh, on a more serious note, I guess, we all know that we lost our friend and colleague, Bill Ruff, since we've been together uh, after a really valiant struggle. Um, up until the last two weeks uh, before uh, Bill died, he was at a committee talking about tuition and keeping himself very engaged in the work that he was doing. So in his honor, um, CHE staff really contrib contributed to the Phyllis Ruff Scholarship Award. I know that many of you who have had the chance to work with Bill really can't imagine Vincent's without Bill. Um, he really was the standard bearer. Uh, so he'll really be missed. And uh, he was a champion for Vincent's and all of higher education. So um, I think it's uh, maybe we'll just take a moment of silence and remember. I'm the, the new chair of the governor's workforce cabinet, and I think it gives us a unique opportunity as a commission and in all of the agencies that touch education in the workforce to align our work much more. We've had some meetings recently, and I want to share just a snippet of the way we're thinking about this work um, as we evolve the cabinet to the next level. Uh, what we're really trying to do in partnership with the employer community is look at the way we serve populations of people as opposed to how what the agencies are. And I'll give you just an example of what I mean by that. As you look at the populations, whether it's the, the pipeline of those coming up through a, a preschool, through a grade 12, whether it's those who are going on to some sort of education beyond high school, the returning adults, the incarcerated population, the veterans, all the populations that we serve that have workforce needs. And if you put all of those here, and then you look at all the agencies that serve those people, and how you align their work. It reminds me a lot of what we did when we put together the commission strategic plan and we trying to do with the workforce is having it really focused on the people we serve. And I think that's going to give us a, a, you know, a better way for clarity around how we use our funds, how we align our programs, and I think CHE sits uniquely in the middle of so much of this work. So I think it's going to be a real opportunity for us. And as we really work on our new, our new strategic plan, for, uh, Reaching Higher in a State of Change, I think it will reflect uh, the work that we're doing at the Cabinet. And I think the Cabinet will reflect our work as well. In this role, I'm, I'm having the opportunity to do some new kinds of uh, events as well. And I, I joined others on a panel. Uh, recently for that was uh, convened by Skillful. You, you may remember we gave you just a little bit of information. Indiana became the second what's called Skillful State, Colorado being the first, and really working around the state to make sure that people have a better understanding of workforce opportunities. Uh, we know that you know, there's a real gap between what the knowledge level is of the opportunities that are out there. Um, we talked a lot today already this particular part of the state. Not surprisingly, a recent Chamber of Commerce uh, survey came out and indicated that 80% of their respondents, uh, their members, said that uh, talented workers was their number one a real concern that they had, finding a talented workforce. Um, so I think all of this informs the work that we're doing at the Commission, and as always, I thank you for the work that each of you uh, commit to doing with us and taking time for this important work. Thank you. And Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we have the minutes from our last meeting. I hope everyone's had an opportunity to review them. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Uh, now to the public square, workforce alignment in Northwest Indiana. <coughs> Steph, Steph, we will turn it over to you to uh, lead this part of our meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> You all know, as the commissioner just mentioned, there's an increasing focus in Indiana on workforce alignment and on regional collaboration. Uh, we know that there are a few pockets of the state 
that were early adopters of that kind of work and have been doing it for, for quite a while. And we know that Northwest Indiana is one of those regions. And that's why we've invited um, Linda Wolachansky from the Center for Workforce Innovations and Heather Ennis from the Northwest Indiana Forum to join us today. They're going to share a little bit about the history and the work of their organizations and um, how they work together to support and build the Northwest Indiana regional economy. Linda is the founding president of the Center for Workforce Innovations, the region's nonprofit workforce development organization. She has more than 30 years of experience in the nonprofit sector helping to drive talent development. Heather is the president and CEO of the Northwest Indiana Forum, a nonprofit focused on creating economic development opportunities for the region. Heather has been a leader on economic development issues in Northwest Indiana communities for more than a decade. I think we're going to start with you, Linda, if you could tell us the origin story of the Center for Workforce Innovation and tell us about your work. Thank you, Stephanie, and I want to thank the, uh, the commission, um, the uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Pass Chairman, and Commissioner Lovers for inviting us here today. Really appreciate um, this opportunity. And I just want to point out, um, Mr. Pass Chairman, that we are so pleased that Northwest Indiana extended its best foot right. forward to make sure that your needs were taken care of. I hope that's how you will remember us. Right. Um, um, so the Center of Workforce Innovation has been in business for 20 years, and uh, Commissioner Lovers could not have said it any better. I mean, we were created with the uh, concept in mind of um, taking a look at the pipeline and looking at a collaborative way of looking at workforce solutions and solving those uh, problems here, those opportunities here in Northwest Indiana as a broader base than just the Center of Workforce Innovation. We knew that, that no one um, agency can tackle an issue like this, and in 2000, we already saw the um, way the world was changing, the way the skill sets were beginning to change, and knew that, that this issue would be a very big issue to come. Maybe not so much in 2000, but it certainly has uh, met our expectation 20 years later. Um, the, the center, we call it CWI, really started out with uh, one particular area, but decided that the, their focus would be broader and they wanted to be positioned mission-wise to be broader. But to begin with, it was working with uh, young people, 16 and older, and the adult population, largely funded from a piece of federal legislation called the Workforce um, Investment Act. And uh, quickly uh, after that, and, and kind of working that strategy with the Workforce Board and with um, staff and various providers, um, we became involved with the whole concept of educational attainment. We worked with four community foundations that received a Lilly Endowment K grant, and as a result, um, for the next four or five years, um, everything was about how to really impact the community to help them begin to see that things needed to change, that we needed to increase our educational attainment levels, that workforce development really starts um, in the, in the pre-K and the early learning um, arena because that's where your brain develops and um, you begin to kind of set the foundation for the rest of your life, um, even though most people don't recognize that. And um, had an opportunity to work in the middle school area um, to really focus on literacy issues, reading, learning, and then on to the more traditional workforce development area. We very soon realized at, um, after that work that there needed to be a focus on, on the career alignment, uh, college and career readiness. And I think that's where I started to work with the commission a, a bit on a college success strategy. And we were able, through a grassroots effort, to begin to pull together actually 34 out of the 36 high schools in Northwest Indiana, Lake Porter, LaPorte, Newton Jasper, Stark, and Pulaski County challenge you to say that right now. <laughs> um, you know, we, we just, you know, the, the geographic area we do most of our work in, um, to, to come on board along with the post-secondary institutions and businesses to talk about what was happening in the economy, what jobs were available, what were the skill sets necessary, what do people need to do in order to move forward. And with this, always keeping in mind the economic development, the um, 
know, the economy, what the employers need. I, I kind of chuckle because I said after 2,000 meetings with employers that I had, it's now up to 3,000, but with those first 2,000 meetings, <coughs> at every meeting, I'm trying to talk about the needs of adults in the workplace, of, of veterans or dislocated workers, and the conversation always shifted to high schools. You know, the K through 12 school, so I said, you know, we really have to do something about this. So the Ready Initiative kind of launched um, with the school systems involved, with the development of a plan with that 100 people had um, input on, and uh, solutions, which the K through 12 and the uh, college and university system and the employers, you know, agreed upon in terms of what to, to do. You know, and what they have been working on all of this time is uh, about careers. Uh, what do we know about careers? What, how are the careers changing? What are the jobs that are available within different industry sectors and how people can prepare for those jobs um, through post-secondary credentials, through college, or through military in order to become employed. Um, we also have the opportunity to receive a really, um, no, I'm sorry, a, a Lumina grant. So working with Jamie Marisota, and his staff, um, taking a look at how this could result in something self-sustaining has been really important. And so to this day, this initiative is still in place and I think is the uh, precursor or the predecessor to graduation pathways, which we now know is it's taking hold everywhere in the state of Indiana. And I do believe our schools are better prepared for that movement forward with various types of work-based learning and with uh, focusing on you know, the big goal of 60% of having post-secondary credentials by 2025. We know we're not going to get there here in Northwest Indiana, but we have made progress. We have tracked the uh, progress of our schools. We have seen more students graduating. We've seen better readiness for college. Um, we're, we're now down to about 10% of the students that are going on to school that need some kind of remediation. That's a huge improvement from 22% when we first started. And we know that the Ready Initiative was, it's not you know, solely responsible for that. Um, there's a lot of different forces working to help make that happen, but we felt like that was really an important piece. You know, the work continues in a lot of different ways. Um, well, back to what Commissioner Lover says in terms of getting the marginally um, disenfranchised people back into the labor force, um, taking a look at folks that still need their high school diploma. Um, and you know, we have different initiatives related to that. But one of the things that we see is so important is the adult population and knowing that in order to achieve our population growth here in Northwest Indiana, which is one of our big goals, that um, and, and to you know, have a better and stronger economy, we need to have more adults upskilling um, and getting more credentials um, in order for the community to really move forward. Our work has been based on collaboration and data as a foundation, and you know we see it lasting for a number of years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Heather, can you tell us about the Northwest Indiana Forum and how its work is aligned to Linda's work at CWI? Certainly. So, um, Chairman Hubbard, Commissioner Hubbard, thank you so much for having us. Uh, Chancellor Lowe, thank you for hosting us in this amazing facility. Uh, we're, we're so lucky to have this asset here in the region. So, um, The Northwest Indiana Forum is the seven county economic development organization. Uh, we also represent Lake Porter, LaPorte, Jasper, Pulaski, and Stark counties. I can probably say it five times fast because I say it so frequently. Um, but uh, so our, our areas overlap and so it's great synergy for us to work well together. Uh, the Northwest Indiana Forum's uh, key critical success factors are to stake out and drive bold initiatives, to be the voice of Northwest Indiana business, to market Northwest Indiana as the place to do business, and then to add values to the investors of the organization uh, that support our work. So um, we've done a lot in the last year around our uh, critical success factor that I mentioned first in the staking out and driving bold initiatives through our Ignite the Region plan. I think uh, Chancellor Lowe mentioned it and has played a critical role in that initiative. Um, when we were looking at the region and, and what need was needed in the region, started about, 
probably two and a half years ago talking about a regional economic development plan and, and where the forum played a role and how we could be helpful uh, to attracting talent and to attracting people and what that looks like. And looking at the other organizations around the uh, region, we realized after trying a couple of times unsuccessfully to do it on our own and in-house, um, that this is a team sport. Economic development really requires uh, collaboration and cooperation. And so we're not the only ones playing in this space. So who could we work with to continue to build this plan to really um, make it meaningful for the region and make it a playbook for economic development that includes all of the partners? Um, we were talking with a couple of organizations that were getting ready to do strategic plans and uh, realized that two closely aligned organizations were doing strategic plans and neither one of them had consulted one another or had even knew that the other one was about to do a, a plan. So um, we realized that uh, there is a great opportunity since all of our work is tangential to, to get everybody together and talk about how the RDA and NERPC and NICTI and the Center of Workforce Innovation and one region and um, the universities and all of us can work together on the economic development plan. So uh, we, uh, at the beginning of 2018, we started an initiative um, driven by the forum, but with partnership from across the region and across all of these partner organizations um, to start to talk about what our regional economic development plan looks like. We rolled that out um, in September of last year, and so that was after uh, 50 plus round table meetings, um, meeting with over almost 500 uh, business leaders in the region. I started a fire. Um, <laughs> I think we've ignited the region, there you go. <laughs> um, so, uh, meeting with um, 500 business leaders, doing several round tables, talking with um, entrepreneurs, uh, manufacturers, healthcare leaders, uh, looking at all sectors, looking at manufacturing, looking at what that means to our region, looking at transportation logistics and what that means. Really evaluating the assets that we have here in the region and trying to figure out how to make them work. And as you know, one of those critical assets of our region is talent. So um, talent is a huge pillar of Ignite the Region. We have five pillars uh, that are our focus. And so um, it's business development and marketing, uh, infrastructure, um, placemaking, talent, and entrepreneurship and innovation. So those are our five pillars. They're obviously building blocks to any great economic development plan. You can't have a great economic development plan without them, but I am pleased to say that we have great organizations that are taking up the charge on that. So we rolled this plan out a year ago, and we've been working hand in glove um, with those other organizations. We do the business development and the marketing side of things. We go out and, and tell the story of Northwest Indiana. Um, Center of Workforce Innovations works on the talent side, along with um, the Leadership uh, Institute at, at PNW, and other organizations that are trying to uh, continue to grow our talent as well. So um, we work very closely on the plan with the RDA and uh, the double tracking and Westlake corridor expansions that are happening here in the region of our uh, South Shore commuter rail line. Those are great opportunities for us to attract more talent. We've been seeing a decline in our population and a decline in our per capita income and um, what really led us to this was that those that's not acceptable and um, for us, we wanted to turn that, those numbers around. So we're measuring consistently those numbers year after year, talking about what we're doing and is it making an impact. And we know that this is, this is a work in progress. We know that this is not etched in stone and, and brought down from the mountaintop. This is something that we will have to continue to evolve. We will have to continue to look at things and go, you know what, that was, that was a really stupid idea. We should never have done that. Let's do this. Oh yeah, we tried that, we thought that was brilliant, that didn't work, how about if we do this? Okay, these five things seem to be working really well. How do we make them um, regionalized? So we have pockets of excellence happening. Uh, the work that Linda's doing with Ready Northwest Indiana is helping to take those pockets of excellence that are happening at the K-12 level um, with the uh, superintendents and really shine spotlights on it so all of the uh, schools can use them as best practice. So all the schools can see that work. We've got wonderful municipalities throughout the region 
Uh, mayor Costa is uh, the mayor of Valparaiso, which is one of our shining stars. We've got great things happening in the city of Hammond, Whiting, Crown Point, um, fantastic things happening. How do we take those pockets of excellence and make them uh, regionalized? And so um, we're excited about the work that's being done. We're excited about the collaboration that we have uh, with CWI. Uh, and, and we continue to try and um, build value for them. Linda serves on my board of directors, and I get to serve on a couple of committees of hers as well. So um, it really is a partnership. We really value each other's opinions and value each other's work and know that um, none of us can do this alone. And so uh, I'd just like to close with this. It's kind of a corny story, but um, there was a saint who, who sat down and, and thought about, I wonder what the difference is like between heaven and hell. And as he started to envision it, he thought, well, okay, in hell I see this big table, banquet table filled with food and all of these people sitting around this table with really long forks on the end of their arms. And they're stabbing at the food and they're crying in agony because they're starving. And they just can't seem to get the food to their mouth. And the forks, you know, they, as much as they try and bend their arms, they can't make it happen. And in heaven, there's the exact same table. And folks sitting around with the long forks on the end of their arms. And they're laughing and joking because they're stabbing the food and feeding it to each other. Um, it's so much better when we cooperate and collaborate. And, you know, that, st that story always just makes me like, oh, okay, this is why we do this. This is why, you know, Linda, Linda's always said, uh, and I love it when she says it, you can go faster alone, but you can go so much further together. So we're, we're grateful for the partnership. Um, thank you both so much for giving us some background on what each of you do individually and the work that you do together. This next part of the public square is uh, supposed to be an interactive conversation. So I have some questions I'm going to pose, and either one of you, both of you should feel free to answer. And then we encourage the commission members to chime in as you have questions. Uh, it's, it should be a casual conversation. So you mentioned your strategic planning processes. The Commission for Higher Education recently began work on its fourth strategic plan, and we're calling it Reaching Higher in a State of Change. And the entire focus is on how our system of higher learning here in Indiana should be positioned to meet the needs of an ever-changing learner population and economy. Can you tell us how things are changing here in the Northwest Indiana region in terms of your population and economy? And how are your organizations responding to those changes? Well, obviously, um, automation is a driving force for, uh, we are heavily manufacturing area and continuing to uh, bring that skill set up for um, um, needs of today's economy. Uh, I started my, my career in manufacturing obviously more than 10 years ago since I've spent 10 years in economic development, which really makes me feel old. But, um, the, and, and, you know, it's amazing the evolution that's happened in that industry um, over the last 20 years. I started doing 3D printing 15 years ago, and it was before 3D printing, I guess 20 years ago, before 3D printing was even cool. Um, but now it's amazing the things that are happening in the economy, and so to continue to try and keep the workforce up, to be lifelong learners, to understand uh, the need <coughs> of, of what the employers are looking for, and as Linda said, you know, really try and tap into that. We have seen population drain, uh, as uh, we, I talked about previously, um, but we're, we're seeing uh, a reinvigorated group of folks that are looking at Northwest Indiana. We, uh, two of our um, municipalities were named as the fastest growing suburbs in Chicago. So um, we really are seeing the tax climate in Chicago and Illinois is, is driving more folks over to our area. Um, but the quality of life aspects and the things that are um, really being put in place by the municipalities are helping us to be able to attract those people and to get them to tell the story of how awesome it is here. So um, we, we have, you know, we did see a decline and we saw a decline through, uh, you know, it can produce still 20% of the nation's steel with about a third of the workforce um, that they needed previously. So uh, we're, we did see a decrease in those types of jobs, but we're now starting to see more uh, thinkers, makers, and innovators. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, I think 
Heather hit the nail on the head with the automation piece, which is really transforming um, all jobs in every community in Indiana, as well as the, uh, the world. Um, we see also kind of the hybrid jobs and the gig economy really playing a, a key role, and um, realize that there needs to be some ways to um, get to the folks that are in that gig economy to help them upgrade their skills as well, because you can't assume uh, that the small business that you might be start, starting on your own will uh, sustain itself, will continue to grow without having the skill sets needed. Um, so that's why, back to the Ignite plan, um, the focus on um, the uh, innovation and uh, the, uh, the, the new business development, from a talent standpoint, we look at everything from every facet that's occurring in order to try to figure out what is, how that translates to the workforce and what needs to happen um, in terms of the skill development in order to support those, uh, those industries, um, including, you know, back to automation and technology, when you look at um, infrastructure development, you look at all the craft trades that we have in Northwest Indiana and how uh, their skills need to continue to improve as well because so much of their work is being invented with a technology background, it becomes really um, critical. You know, we also have the issue of um, lower um, unemployment, which is also in um, throughout the state of Indiana. Of course, Northwest Indiana has had the highest um, unemployment rate, unfortunately, for the last um, three years. But it's finally, um, you know, decreasing, which we're very pleased about. So we also see um, the economic development activities that are occurring through Heather's organization and the IDC as well as the local economic development organizations and the municipalities really starting to pay off. Excuse me, is the um, uh, population drain primarily Gary, the city, or is it throughout the region? Well, we've had two uh, counties that have increased in population, Porter and Jasper County, but there has been a decline in all the others, um, Lake LaPorte, Newton, the, the, the smaller counties have, have lost population. And so, you know, we, we know we have an aging uh, population, aging workforce. We don't see a, a lot of births occurring, and that's why the whole attraction issue because becomes really important to be able to um, have a placemaking strategy and a, a good business climate here, uh, good quality of life in order to uh, attract people uh, to locate here. Uh, largely, we see the Illinois population as a strong area to um, recruit from, and um, we've seen some great successes in some of the communities making that happen. Great. Um, well, you know, we sort of discussed this, and Dennis Wan always brings this issue up. We're working at a state level as well. Do you think that the, the people who live in this area, and I would extrapolate to this to the state generally, have an understanding of the kinds of issues that you're talking about, the changing nature of the world of work, are they, uh, what kinds of incentives do we have to take the message that you two convey so well to people making behavioral changes about their educational and workforce journeys? Well, I think that is the real issue, is that they don't understand what's really occurring, they don't, they don't have a sense of uh, what the changing nature of jobs are, um, or what the opportunities are. And, you know, I just met with the uh, uh, college career readiness coaches and placement folks this morning uh, from across the region, and, um, you know, they, they talked about how that's one of the toughest facets of kind of university life and the whole retention issue, because they offer individuals opportunities um, to, to have a particular focus, a degree focus, a career plan, um, and demonstrate how there are employers ready to hire them, internships, uh, specialized programs that employers are offering, and yet it is so hard to get folks to actually move in the direction where those jobs are at, and they just are kind of um, uh, wandering um, with, without any clear path. And Generally, I think we feel like it is the general population that doesn't understand this, and certainly more needs to be done with the middle school and up students in order for them to have a better sense of what this all means. And that's why the READY initiative has been so important and has so much more opportunity ahead of itself.
we could really maximize and, and help it get, gain scale because um, Ready is largely focused on the uh, superintendents, the principals, the teachers, the, the counselors, and helping them understand what those jobs are and the opportunities are so that then they are influencing those students every single day and can have such an impact on those children in a very positive way if they had more information and had a better understanding of the labor market. Um, you know, I mean, in terms of, of placemaking, you mentioned very, like, I mean, what that is important. I mean, I, 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 I can tell what, uh, in, in your conversation, but, but what, if, what are those anchor projects that will bring all this together? I mean, do you have anything like that? Are you working on anything like that? Or what are your shining stars that I mean, you talk about? How, how all that comes together uh, in terms of development? So, so we've seen some great anchor projects. Uh, I'll point to Mayor Costas again, um, has, has set up a, a wonderful square in downtown Valparaiso that has an amphitheater and a, a skating arena where you can um, ice skate in the winter and have events in the summer. Um, it's, it's a beautiful gathering place. And, um, and it's remarkable. The businesses that, that had, have outdoor dining on, on the um, front of the square and, and really creates a festive atmosphere now also have di dining on the back of their restaurants because they back up to the square and they there's so much going on there that they want to see what's happening. Um, I mentioned Whiting previously. Uh, Mayor Joe Stahura has created a mascot hall of fame, um, which you know everyone was like, "Well, oh, that's kind of a crazy idea," but it's this awesome children's museum um, that celebrates mascots and brings people from all over the country. Uh, they're just getting ready for their first induction of mascots, and so you know I'm rooting for Purdue Pete, but you know I don't I, <laughs> I don't think that he's going to make the ballot this year. But but it's you know it's exciting to see uh, the different things that communities have done to engage their uh, their people in place making. And um, Wedding's also done a really great project where they've um, they given they have houses that they sell at a very low. I think I want to say that it's a hundred dollars or something like that. But with the uh, contract that the um, purchaser will improve the facade by X amount in, within the next year and really create that home atmosphere where these houses that had previously been abandoned now have, have the opportunity to, to be showcased. Um, there's several of our communities that have facade grants and things like that for their downtown businesses and um, are using uh, the Riverfront Development District to encourage downtown restaurants and things like that. So, so really creating that, um, I think most people have taken a play out of Mayor Costas' playbook of, I want you to be able to come downtown and feel like there's always gonna be something happening. Um, and so a lot of our cities have, have really embraced that attitude and it's pretty exciting. Um, we, we were laughing, uh, we went on, I went on vacation uh, last week, and I missed like 20 things, and and so so I think when it was you and I were having the conversation, and and we were like, if anyone in Northwest Indiana said that they were bored at all in the last three months, they're really not looking very hard for something to do because there's we had a boat race on on uh, the lake in Michigan City. There you know tons of activity happening all over the place. So um, it's it's exciting to see, and and part of it is because. We've had all of these new people that have moved in that really appreciate the value of the quality of life <coughs> um, and have a lot of uh, disposable capital to be able to spend in the area. So uh, we are humble people in Northwest Indiana and we've tended to not tell our story as well um, as maybe we could have. And so that I think that it's exciting to see people really being excited about the region and telling great stories about the region and um, really wanting to create that quality of place where they can hang out with their neighbors. You know, and I think it's too early to have any metrics on it, um, but the Ignite plan is, um, has a number of, of uh, intended metrics that we'll be looking at over time to see if we're making progress. And as Heather said, I think we're, we've got, you know, the, the bookends of Whiting and Michigan City on either side of Northwest Indiana, and then of course Valparaiso right in the center and everything else kind of springing, springing out from those um, communities. And, and you know, we see it as being really fantastic. John. So we were talking earlier, just one who's uh, lived here all my life, and, and uh, 
You know, the, the impact of the steel mills, what happened to the steel mills, still reverberates here because if the if the employment is 50,000 and we have 30% uh, of that left, you know, that's what 35,000 jobs, really good jobs that we had in the 60s or the 50s and 60s. And, and so there was almost this, this, this thinking Um, but really automation has changed all that and not just those jobs, but all the related jobs. There's so many jobs that are related to steel, so that number is bigger than that. And, and we are in many ways still recovering from that. <coughs> and, um, and, and so that, that's kind of the challenge is, is in a sense to some degree a mindset, uh, but, but it's also, uh, it's also uh, just the sheer number of jobs. So, so, and that kind of brings up the other point that slaves are alluding to is, you know, so when you think of economic development, it's a chicken or an egg, you know, because so many companies that are wanting to expand, the first question is, what about the workforce? Is there a workforce? What kind of workforce? You know, we hear it all the time. And, and so, so uh, there's really a, a, a feel that, that what we need to do is, is and, and, and I know Eric Doden has mentioned this when he, he championed cities initiative, you know, we've got to make our, our cities the kind of places where this workforce wants to live. Right. You know? So it almost starts with the amenities to some degree, making the cities work well, because we're attracting, I think, you know, a lot of uh, younger people who think, hey, this is a pretty cool place to live, and it's affordable too, and it's safe, and the schools are good, all those things, you know, it's not just you know, we have events almost every night in the summer, and we had 3,000 people at the park with the symphony last night. But the point is, is you know, they can live there affordably, sustainable, and you know, even creating the connection. So we have five, five buses, four buses, soon to be six. I don't know, it's going directly into the heart of Chicago, bringing that good money back. So we are a suburb of Chicago. How do we take advantage of that? Well, we started express bus service. That is just, and we're working with. We're getting double tracking. Now we have, we're working with uh, the um, South Shore to, to we have a, a bus that's going back and forth South Shore so that if you can't get to work late, you come back to South Shore, you can come back to where you start with the bus. So we're trying to be integrated. So it's all those things working together and the growth we see coming from our current business is expanding, whether it be, you know, CSI, which is uh, cybersecurity, uh, whether it be Lake Cable, or they make cable, or you know, Urschel's has certainly expanded, um, uh, and uh, Task Force Tips, I and mean, these are kind of medium-sized businesses that are growing, but they have the workforce to grow. So it's a, it's really a very, it's, it's a, a, a complex area when it comes to economic development, workforce development, and and uh, and I think we're making progress certainly, uh, but those are some of the, um, that's kind of the legacy that that we've been uh, working. With. Anything you want to add to that, please? Yeah, I think I think it's really it's really true. And and the awesome place, thing about place making from the double tracking and the Westlake uh, opportunity that uh, Mayor Costas talked about is that there's transit development districts around those areas. And so with those transit development districts, uh, legislation was passed to be able to utilize uh, the uh, increase in income that's coming into those areas to be not just TIF, but uh, sales tax increment and others that can help to build out those areas and really make them part of a place where you get off the train and you feel a sense of community right when you right when you land. You're not just landing in a parking lot, you're landing um, in a place that feels like home. So um, it's, it's pretty exciting to see uh, those transformational projects and, and uh, the dash and uh, that that uh, you have going into Chicago is an outstanding example of if you if you connect people to these amenities and have a great quality of place, people will locate there, and, and your population is, has grown um, considerably because of it. So, I mean, I, I commend uh, Mayor Costas on the work that he's done, and I think that you know we'll see more of that coming from the double tracking and Westlake. 
You know, we also, back to a complex um, area, we are a complex little community here um, with all the different um, also industries that we have. We can't focus just on one because, you know, we have strong manufacturing, uh, strong construction and trades, uh, logistics, healthcare. And, you know, the other thing that I think we really want to focus on more is the whole IT um, area. I mean, it is not our strength. It may never be our strength, but it certainly is um, an area that can lead to employment in other sectors as well as um, bring um, jobs here eventually. But even if we create the talent, the talent has the opportunity to go to Chicago. Um, which is in desperate need of IT um, folks and then live here in Northwest Indiana and then at some point we'll have enough talent here that it'll start to attract some of those IT industries here to Northwest Indiana. So we have a kind of a big job to do in terms of um, taking a look at all of these challenges. So, so in terms of manufacturing, I mean, you, you mentioned manufacturing being so, so important. I mean, how about all that advanced manufacturing? I mean, it's going beyond that just basic manufacturing and hands work and operators and, and, and combining maybe the IP needs that they have with the manufacturing part. I mean, anything done on that? Oh, well, yes. I mean, even our steel industries are becoming more automated. And quite frankly, I mean, none of the steel industries hire people with a high school diploma. Um, all of them need post-secondary credentials. I mean, uh, just talk to the colleges and universities that are that gather together to talk about how they can prepare their students for those great jobs in um, the steel industry. So all of them are really picking up steam in terms of that automation. And you know, many of our um, manufacturers are moving in that direction. So. Um, we see, once again, a, a great need there to upskill the existing workforce and to make sure that the pipeline is ready for what is available and to, to overcome that, that urban folklore that uh, the jobs there are, are not that difficult and that um, you only need a high school diploma. I, I have a question. Um, the, the steel industry I find uh, fascinating. Uh, it's my understanding we're the biggest steel producer. State in the country, is that right? 20% of the nation's steel is made Pardon here. me? 20% of the nation's steel is made here. Is made here. And yet today we do it with 6,000 employees where they have 35,000 or something uh, 30 years ago. Quarter to a third of what it was. Yeah. Right. It, so when they are recruiting, do, do, would, would, they tell, would the steel companies tell you they have trouble finding employees and how integrated are they with the Ivy Techs of the world and the universities and the high schools to try to prepare. Yes, uh, extremely. <laughs> yes, and extremely integrated. Um, Linda, do you want to talk a little bit about the steel worker future? Yep. So Arcelor, Arcelor Middle has a steel worker for the future program that is working on helping individuals get a two-year associate degree, providing them with internships in the summer while they're working on their degree. And they have done this with um, Ivy Tech and, and Purdue. Um, Past. So they are, um, you know, trying to ramp up uh, the development of the workforce, and they really do have a challenge. I mean, for any given job at Arcelor Middle, when when they have a, a call for hiring, um, actually the Work One system handles the first phase of that process, and um, 5,000 people will apply for 300 jobs, and Arcelor will have a hard time really finding 300 qualified individuals out of those 5,000. So they really do have challenges and um, they are, are relying and that's a really exciting time from uh, you know, my business standpoint as you're, you're trying to help people navigate this and get these jobs. Employers are now really reaching out to the schools. They're reaching out to the universities and colleges and asking for help, saying they want to partner um, to make things happen. So they're um, now investing in these different strategies. Maybe not at the level we would like to see, but they, that this partnership is developing and they're starting to really um, come up with more unique ways to tackle the issue. And they do see it as a long-term issue. Of course, everybody needs somebody tomorrow, right? I mean, that's the way it is for every industry and every employer. But they also recognize that the solution will take some time to really materialize. One question I want to make sure Please, we ask is, how can the state 
uh, better support the work that you're doing. We have um, a lot of new initiatives. There's Governor Holcomb's Next Level Jobs Initiative. There's the Workforce Ready Grant, non-tuition certificate, or non-tuition free certificates in high demand areas, and then the Employer Training Grant, which reimburses employers. Are, is this community utilizing any of that? Um, do you think they know about it? There's also you know, the, the Career Connections and Talent Hub now. Are you doing any work with Blair Milo and her team? How are you interacting with the state and how can we better support you? Well, I'll start with Next Level Jobs. We promote it like crazy when we go out and talk with companies and uh, folks that are looking to come to the area. Um, site selectors and brokers and companies think that it is great. And so it is a little limited on, on the amount of funding that's available for it. So we do tend to burn through, through the available funding uh, relatively quickly, but I think that it, it, is a, it starts a really great conversation and it lets prospects know that Indiana is serious about workforce, serious about trying to provide the talent um, that's needed by these companies. And so, um, it, you know, Georgia has always been um, put forth as a great model of, of a state that's doing it right. Um, a lot of site selectors um, have said, this is a great program and it, it, it looks like if you continue to build upon it, that you could rival what, what's being done um, in Georgia and, and really, you know, Center Workforce Innovation does a great job of putting ombudsman uh, to projects as well so that we, when we bring prospects in, um, we can work hand in glove to make sure that they understand what the uh, workforce availability is, they understand the process and the ability to um, help get folks on board and, and when we bring uh, CWI in early, uh, usually the prospects' talent questions are quelched pretty quickly, um, and they feel comfortable that we, although we may not have the workforce, but through our educational system and our partners in that arena, we will be able to train quickly the people that they need. And so we've seen hoist lift trucks uh, moved over state lines and, and was a little concerned about workforce, set our workforce innovations, got them sat down uh, with Ivy Tech. They, produced a, a program in order to be able to train their employees and um, they're, they're, they're uh, being able to hire everyone that they need. So they're in East Chicago. So want to talk about Yes, yes. Uh, you know, I also want to say that's a really fun part of the job. It's because we're able to sit at the table with um, Heather's group or the IEDC and represent the, um, the talent here, but also the resources that are here in Northwest Indiana. So we are able to make sure that we know what is happening at each of the universities, what programs that they're offering and, you know, at the high schools, so that we're prepared to be able to share that information with these companies as they're looking at um, the community and, and can then bring them to the table as well. You know, we are involved with um, Blair's um, 21st century, um, 21st century talent, talent. Talent regions. There's so many initiatives that I forget what they all are after a while. Um, and so, you know, we have made an application for that and are moving forward. We actually had started this kind of process three years ago, and with a small group of people began to meet to talk about, you know, how to better coordinate and collaborate and take a look at the important metrics. Um, that we needed to keep measuring and programs that needed to support those metrics so we could achieve those outcomes. We did get stalled on that because of the Ignite strategy, which then um, actually took two years so far um, to really get off the ground. And so now we're ready to jump back into um, the uh, work with the Civic Lab and uh, moving forward on the 21st Century Talent Initiative. So one thing that the state can do, besides next level jobs, which I echo Helen's comments about being seen very favorably here in Northwest Indiana, even the work ready piece related to employers, I mean, are, um, is working really quite well. I have um, talked to a number of people about it, a number of employers who are very impressed. Um, even Parcel Middle is using the employer training grant, about 30 people in, in training opportunities that otherwise would not have been uh, partaking in upgrading their skills. Um, but we would ask that um, that the state could work a little more closely with our kind of regional uh, groups here that are already in place before creating new strategies. 
um, because then what we sometimes have is people tripping over each other as we're trying to get coordinated to kind of move an agenda forward. And so we really lose time and resource if, if this is not all um, kind of collaborated um, on, uh, prior to um, strong implementation. <coughs> and you know, other marketing that can be done on the whole career front um, would be greatly appreciated. Um, that is going to take a, once again, a long-term strategy in order to um, impress upon the community about what the careers are that are available, the, the changing nature of jobs, and if the state is thinking about doing anything of that nature, that would be super, and we can kind of build on that. If you have a template, that at the local or regional level, we can jump on board and it, you know take that to the next step and use that, just as we have with next level jobs. Because as Heather said, the minute that, that surfaced, the marketing started, um, you know, meeting with employers, doing small groups of people, trying to expose everyone to it um, before the state really launched their major marketing campaign. Dennis? Yes, you mentioned earlier that you all have a 5,000 people applying for 300 jobs and you can't fill them. What are the specific <coughs> gaps or deficits to keep you from filling those positions? Um, a, a major gap is math skills. Um, that, that folks are um, not equipped to um, handle those um, uh, assessment tests. Yes. The Ramsey is a test that's used by the by Arcelor, and folks can't pass the Ramsey test. You know, um, many of the jobs in the steel industry are either IT or um, electrical electricians, and um, that is a real challenge. Mechanical, electrical um, technicians, maintenance technicians are key jobs here in Northwest Indiana. Every community that you go to, every county, those are key jobs that in, in people, employers in manufacturing are looking to fill, and uh, maintenance jobs. Um, so those all relate to you know, strong math skills. And then how intentional are we about, with the laser-like focus, connecting North, Northwest Indiana for IV Northwest? these initiatives directly with students and schools and K through 12 and saying these are the specific issues, gaps, holes, and challenges that are preventing us from getting these opportunities. How intentional and laser like are we in that particular strategy or initiative? You know, it has, it, it certainly could use more attention, but it has been intentional. Um, that uh, skills that need, the need for math skills, it's communicated loud and clear to the K through 12 system. As folks talk about jobs and what is needed, the skill sets needed in the jobs, um, it is um, spoken of frequently and we remind the schools that that is a key issue. We've had some specialized math professional development um, taught by the folks at the college and universities um, to the teachers in the K through 12 system, so we're, we're trying to make that connect. But certainly more needs to be done. Very good question, Dennis. Well, we're running out of time. Uh, I want to thank uh, Heather and Linda for taking the time to come and present to us today. Uh, Northwest Indiana is indeed fortunate to have you ladies leading the charge. And obviously, having John as your uh, colleague uh, is, I'm sure, incredibly important. Uh, it's 16 years. Uh, as a key leader up here. So thank you very much, and uh, we very much appreciate it. <laughs> now, Mike Alley, you know, our new secretary. Well, Mr. Chairman, it's my pleasure to acknowledge that uh, we have uh, 14 members on the commission, 13 of which are, I have observed are present here today, with the sole exception of Jeff Fisher, who had a conflict and was not able to be here. Consequently, I declare a quorum because we do have more than eight members present. So we do have a quorum. Thank you very much. That's Setting a new standard. <laughs> yeah, he's much more efficient than the former secretary. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have one academic de degree program for full discussion. It's, uh, I, I really can't pronounce it. It's six syllables. And I only know one other word that has six syllables. Okay, what? Oh, the, the commissioner will. It, 
muscular skeletal. There you go, muscular skeletal. Muscular skeletal. The doctor of philosophy of musculo. I say that's too much. <laughs> Uh, but it's a bit, I enjoyed reading about this uh, degree, and uh, I'm sure everyone else did too. And I, we have Dr. Fred Pavalko who will uh, explain uh, why this degree is important. Hey, I'm giving you all kinds of tough words to pronounce. <laughs> why, 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 why we should support it. So, Fred, thanks for being here. Uh, thank you very much for the chance to come and talk to you. I've been impressed with the breadth of things that the commission has to deal with. So to take a few minutes to talk about a specific new degree, uh, I really appreciate it. We're very excited. So about Fred, can I interrupt? Can, yeah. can you share with us your, your position? Yeah, so my, my name is Fred Pavalko. I'm a professor at Indiana University. Uh, I'm in the School of Medicine. Um, my department is Anatomy, uh, Cell Biology, and Physiology. And I'm a member of the Indiana Center for Musculoskeletal Health. And it's this, uh, Center for Musculoskeletal Health is really the driving force behind this new degree. Um, we have, I've been here, I came to Indiana as a assistant professor in 1991, and it's been a privilege to be here for the last 28 years and watch musculoskeletal health research really grow. I, I came as a 30-year-old cell biologist and was drawn into this field, and there were just a handful, three or four, uh, orthopedists and basic cell biologists at Indiana who uh, created the nucleus of what would become and is now one of the premier international uh, groups, research groups with uh, about 90 faculty and over $95 million in, in funding um, that are all located in Indianapolis. And, and this group started out with about four or five people in the late 80s. Um, I was fortunate enough to sort of get that number up to about eight or 10 by the early 2000s and this uh, program has just exploded. And the School of Medicine recognized musculoskeletal health as, a, as an area um, of great potential for um, recruiting faculty, students, and training students to work in areas of emerging um, uh, medical needs. So this is really a, a healthcare story um, where we're going to be able to provide uh, students um, with a high level training to get a PhD in a specialized area of musculoskeletal health. The, World Health Organization um, identified the bone as the uh, uh, organ of the, of the decade in the 2000s. And what that did was it, it highlighted to people that musculoskeletal health research, especially skeletal biology, is a disease that's understudied. Um, there really aren't very many good drugs for treating skeletal diseases, osteoporosis being one of the main ones. And so Indiana University recognized that this was an area for growth and they promoted recruitment of, of new faculty and it sort of culminated in 2016 with the hiring of a director for a new center for musculoskeletal health, uh, Linda Bonewald, who we recruited um, to come to Indiana. And just in the last three years since she's been here, we've, we've uh, brought in a lot of you know, new faculty. And so we thought what we really need is an innovative new degree that will let students come work with us and will reflect the kind of training that this musculoskeletal health center uh, is able to provide. Um, typically, if a, if a person gets uh, a PhD degree uh, in the School of Medicine, it will be in a, in a discipline. It'll be in something like physiology or biochemistry or anatomy. And that's great, but that doesn't really tell employers what the skill set that the student might have because they have this degree. And so what we are doing is proposing a new degree that's not based in the department. It's based in this Center for Musculoskeletal Health uh, Science. And so it'll be a, a, a interdisciplinary degree involving people, faculty from multiple departments in the School of Medicine, multiple schools on the Indianapolis campus like the School of Health and Human Sciences, uh, engineering and technology at IEPUI. So it's gonna be a really, um, it, it sort of breaks the mold of, of getting a traditional PhD in a, in a discipline-based uh, science. And, and what this is going to do is it's going to let students come out of this degree program and employers will know this is what you're trained in. You know, if, if somebody comes to you and they, they have, even if you uh, run a company uh, that's a medical device company in Indiana or cook one of the many arms of Cook Biotech or even Lilly, quite often the degree of, of 
biochemistry or microbiology doesn't tell you a whole lot about what the student's training is. So I think this is the wave of the future, is having these degrees that are, are really more descriptive of the kind of research. And we're really not the first one. We've got a neuroscience degree. Uh, some of you may remember, um, go back far enough. That was an interdisciplinary degree, and that's an extremely popular degree. And we think this musculoskeletal health sciences uh, PhD can, can fill that same um, need for um, a, providing a degree that gives employers uh, a better sense of what the students have been trained to do. This is high level training. They spend four, five, six years um, just getting this PhD degree. It's a research intensive degree. And um, sometimes just calling it an anatomy degree or a physiology degree uh, doesn't cut it. And, and what's really unique and, and innovative, I think, about this degree is we've pulled in faculty from around the world. Um, we have become um, a destination for people who want to get training in the area of musculoskeletal health research. And what we, the one thing we're lacking, we've had great success recruiting faculty, we've had great success getting um, millions and millions of dollars of extramural funding, a lot of it from NIH, a lot of from international disease foundations. Um, you know, generating 90 or $95,000 in external research funding today from a group that in 1991 consisted of about five of us. I think is really something we're very proud of. But what we needed, we thought, was a degree that would let uh, students um, be able to, to broadcast to employers what their training is in. And that's, that's what this degree uh, is, is really meant to do. Um, we have, um, we have uh, students who, um, who are finishing their PhD degrees now, working with scientists in this field, who are going to get a degree in anatomy. Um, most of them get an anatomy, some will get in physiology, and they would love to be able to have that kind of, uh, have a degree that says musculoskeletal health sciences. Um, we came here, my wife and I both worked for Indiana, we came here in 91, and we thought really, my wife is at IU Bloomington, I'm at IU TUI, we had a three-year-old daughter, and we thought, well, you know, it's hard for two new PhDs to get jobs somewhere, so we'll, we'll come to Indiana, we came from North Carolina, and we figured we'd stay four or five years and we'd move on. And, well, almost 30 years later, we're still here, and, and um, I, I really am proud of this story because that three-year-old daughter that came with us from North Carolina had just finished up a PhD in the anatomy department in Indianapolis, and she's in the area of musculoskeletal health, and she's like, Dad, why couldn't you have done this degree you know, four or five years ago? I, I wouldn't have to have an anatomy degree and explain to people, well, I really work on what makes bone healthy and what we need to do to uh, figure out how to develop new drugs that can be uh, generated and brought to market to treat these diseases. So uh, there really is a need for this sort of interdisciplinary degree. And this is the kind of thing I hope you all see more of in the future and, and encourage people these sort of interdisciplinary degrees that are based on um, not just the, the sort of more archaic names of, of, of disciplines, especially in the health sciences, but that encourage uh, interdisciplinary collaboration between departments and schools. So, um, we're very proud of this degree. We think this is going to be a great job generator for, for Indiana. Um, the, the, the places that people can work with this degree, uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies, we have, I, have, I have multiple students who work, have worked or work at Lilly. Uh, two students who worked at, one at Cook Medical, one at Cook Biotech. Um, this is, this is um, something that um, I think is, is kind of the wave of the future, and, and we're able to do it because of what I think is a, would be a perfect case example of how to take a small uh, research group. It doesn't have to be in healthcare. It could be in anything. Take a small research group and nurture it into an internationally recognized group of people that so it becomes a destination for where the best faculty and the best students want to come. And we've done that with this degree over the, with this musculoskeletal health program um, over the last 25 years. And I think having this degree in this field is, is just sort of a, um, a icing on the cake to, to sort of help complete um, a destination sort of for students. Thank you very much, Fred. Did you pressure your daughter into that? Or <laughs> you know, people told me early on, do not, uh, she, she'd come into the lab with me on the weekends and stuff, and she, but they said, don't press. So I didn't, I didn't pressure her. She went off and, and she did her own thing, and then after a couple years, um, out doing various things, on all on her own, she came back and she said, you know, 
I think you like what you do a lot better than any of the things it looks like I'm going to do. Um, she got she got a, a, a bachelor's degree at Purdue um, in biomedical engineering and said, "Well, I want to get a PhD and, and 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 do this." So no, I didn't pressure her. If I had, she wouldn't be she wouldn't have gotten that degree. Um, so that's a good lesson for anybody who um, it's kind of fun actually to have your adult daughter working in the same building with you and. Doing, and being able to talk about uh, things other than just grandkids, although talking about grandkids is fun. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, um, any other questions for Fred? I wish you could be a little more passionate about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of ambivalent about this it. Is, this, is little, this is weird for me because when I stand at a lecture, and I'm usually either lecturing to medical students or talking about my research, so I'm totally out of my element. But this is genuinely something that we are very excited about. I'm going to a meeting and uh, um, in bone and muscle research next month, an international meeting, and I've already got a couple of appointments set up with students who want to learn more about this degree because they've heard through the grapevine that we've proposed this degree. So you get into the blood marrow, the bone marrow. We do, we do. Um, the the things that I've talked about sort of focused on on bone health itself, but bone cancer, um, the bone marrow is the the source of a lot of, of bone cancers. Um, I haven't. Uh, we, we we talk about stem cell differentiation and the use of stem cells to treat that we take from the bone marrow and treat different kinds of diseases like not just bone diseases but also skeletal dis, uh, diseases, um, muscular dystrophy, other you know muscle atrophy. Um, anybody who's been through chemotherapy knows that muscle wasting is just a terrible thing and can be even if you come through the the other end of chemo doing fine. Um, maybe you've lost 30, 40 percent of your muscle mass, and, and so these are the kind of questions that this um, that research in this area addresses. Um, one other quick plug: we even have mice going up uh, to the International Space Station um, oh. that are headed by a, a faculty member in this group, um, who's actually just about to have their second uh, set of mice uh, sent up to the space station for the second part of an ongoing project. So it, it, touches, it touches on a lot of things, and. And I think I, I want, as much as I want to highlight this very innovative degree, I really want to highlight the, to you all the, uh, this bone and muscle research group in this musculoskeletal center uh, that we have. I, I hope if nothing else, you, uh, you'll, even though it's hard to pronounce, that next time you hear it, um, you'll remember that it's a, 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 a really big part of Indiana University um, and, a, and, a, and a prime example of how to grow a research program. Thank you very much, Brad. Thanks. I appreciate it. Let's see. We now, it's time for Ken Sauer to let the staff, I don't know, Ken, are you enthusiastic about this, like Fred? <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, this is simply an instance where a program is before the commission for full discussion because it's innovative, it's important to the state's economy, and it's nice to be able to celebrate it and call some attention to the great work that's going on at the university. So with that, I would simply offer the staff recommendation, which is that the commission approve the PhD in musculoskeletal health to be offered by Indiana University at IUPUI. Be pleased to respond to any questions. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, thanks, son. Fred, you were very convincing. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, throughout the country. So it's an exciting thing for us to have. What it is is um, a facility that will be um, next to our football stadium that will not only be a practice facility for football, but also other field sports, uh, including soccer, baseball, softball, and actually will be utilized heavily by our marching band. Uh, they'll be very excited for it all, but it'll also be a multi-purpose space uh, for folks on campus. 95% uh, of the facility, which is 8,400 square feet, will be used for um, uh, the field, and then uh, there'll be 5% that's used for office space, restrooms, and those sorts of things, but the bulk of the building really is the practice facility. Uh, it's a $15 million project, and we're excited to say uh, that it will be philanthropically funded, so uh, that's an exciting thing. Uh, with that, I'm happy to take questions. Enthusiastic ones. <laughs> Just to clarify, you said every dollar of $15 million is philanthropically funded? Yes. The uh, public campaign has not been launched, but at this point we have $14.2 million, and we expect to be uh, ready to go in time for bid time. So. Congratulations. Great. Yeah. Move yeah. approval. <coughs> uh, did it, Alicia, did you have any comments? Nothing additional to add. It's just their states will be quick on all of these. Staff recommends approval of the project. There was a motion. Was there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Congratulations, Becca. Uh, now, Ivy Tech, the Columbus campus main building replacement. Mary Payne. Good afternoon. Thank you, members of the committee. Mary Jane Michael Lack with Ivy Tech. Ivy Tech is seeking approval for our replacement of our main building on our Columbus campus. The polling hall is about 37 years old. It is the oldest facility on an Ivy Tech campus that has not undergone a major renovation. Um, the cinder block building does not lend itself well to renovations and the limited space on campus would mean that if we did a renovation of the project, we would have to bring in uh, portable classrooms and it would extend the construction time. The difference in cost between renovating the existing building and building a new is about $1.5 million. So the campus felt like moving forward with a brand new facility was the way to go. This is the number one priority that we had during the 2019 General Assembly. You may recall that it was the Commission's recommendation to the General Assembly that this be included in the budget, and this has been added to the list that Governor Holcomb has um, suggested for cash funding as opposed to bond, which was what was approved by the General Assembly. So we're asking for approval for $32.9 million, not to exceed $32.9 million, about 29 of that will come from state funding, and we plan to fundraise for about $3 million of that. If we aren't able to raise the $3 million, then furniture, fixtures, equipment, those types of things will be reduced at the time. Happy to answer any questions. So will this be built in a different location or adjacent to, or? It, it will be built right behind the current building, which will then be torn down. Any other questions? Alicia, where are you on this? Staff recommends approval of this project as well. Thank you. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed, same sign. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, IE Bloomington, the Lilly Library Innovation. Tom Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. Uh, I'm happy to uh, bring before you. Uh, the, at the IU Bloomington campus, the Lilly Library renovation. Um, and uh, this is a project uh, that uh, we are very pleased about. Uh, on the Bloomington campus, the Lilly Library, many people have not been there, but this is our library for the collection of rare materials. Uh, think of rare books, rare, man rare manuscripts that have been collected over decades of time that are treasures to the state and to the country. Um, uh, if you think about records that go back to uh, colonial times, that go back to the Civil War, um, the papers of former governors, former senators, congressmen, um, and state legislators, um, rare manuscripts of books, um, 
complete collection of original Gutenberg Bibles. Um, every time I, I do a little research on this project, I, I find um, new things that are just fascinating. The library was built in the early 1960s with the help of the Lilly family. The collection, a lot of the collection at that time came from Eli Lilly's collection. And, uh, and so now we're pleased to say that after nearly 60 years, the building is in need of renovation uh, for to preserve that collection. Uh, the project is $12.4 million. The building is just over 50,000 square feet. This will allow us to uh, improve HVAC, plumbing, electrical, fire suppression <laughs> system, security, all the things that you would think about in a, in a, in a repository for these kinds of documents. And um, uh, it is nearly completely funded by a grant from the Lilly Endowment. Um, and uh, uh, glad to answer any questions that you might have. So I'm uh, just curious, you said nearly fully funded. How would you make up the It'll be from library funds. Okay. So uh, it's a $12 million prop, 12.4, and 11 million is coming from the Lilly now. Okay. Any other questions? Alicia? Uh, we recognize the importance of preserving and presenting all the library's significant collections, so staff recommends approval of the project. Is there a motion? Move, move, move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Thank you, Tom, and congratulations. Purdue, West Lafayette, Engineering and Polytechnic Gateway. Tony, on. Thank you. I have two projects for review today. Uh, we'll start with the Gateway Building. Both of the projects, in fact, are, are pretty transformative to the West Lafayette campus. I think you'll find they're both aligned with our missions and strengths quite well. <coughs> Now, the Engineering and Polytechnic Gateway Building should seem familiar to you. It was our number one request during this legislative session. And it was, in fact, our request was funded by the state at, uh, at the amount of $60 million in bonding authority, and then we had pledged $20 million in gifts. What has changed since the legislative session, however, though, is due in part to the, the, uh, the support of this group, uh, the General Assembly and their vote of confidence for the $60 million funding, uh, we have had a donor commit $60 more million dollars to do phase two of this project. What we had proposed initially was always phase one with the idea of doing phase two at some point later, but with the additional $60 million gift, that will allow us to do phases one and two at the same time. Obviously, there's uh, construction efficiencies to doing them all at once. So this will be a uh, 225, a 255,000 square foot building consisting of a majority of lab space, uh, wet and dry lab space, and it will accommodate the growth in our engineering and polytechnic institute. We've seen 22% <coughs> growth in engineering in five years and 31% growth in the polytechnic institute in the last five years. So we have crammed the students in every possible space and. We haven't changed our footprint in those schools in those five years. So this will accommodate the growth that will be the home of the industrial engineering department as well as the nuclear engineering department. There will be specialty nuclear engineering labs. Uh, there will also be the construction management and the computer information technology labs based here. And they'll be built on where two older buildings, turn of the century buildings, are currently placed that will save some deferred R&R, &R and we use better and more dense use of space in our engineering mall. So currently then, that takes it to a $140 million project with 60 million coming from the state in fee replaced debt, uh, gift funds that now total $74 million and operating fund reserves of 5.9 million, which we expect then will be made up by more gifts as the College of Engineering continues to fundraise. Any questions? It's a deal we can't refuse, right? I, 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 I have one question. Is the donor's name going to be on the building? Uh, yet to be determined. In fact, we'll, uh, we'll announce that donor when, when the time is right and we've, uh, when we have everything in order. Uh, but the, I'm sure there will be naming opportunities. <laughs> so you're ready to step up. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And Alicia, where are you? Are you the donor, Alicia? <laughs> Pardon me? All right. <laughs> so, as Tony mentioned, uh, this was a project that the commission recommended through the budget process, so staff recommends approval of the project. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Folks, same sign. Congratulations, Tony. Thank you. This, this will be an incredible project that will open then in fall of 2022. Wow. The, the next project for your review is a pretty special project both to the university and myself. This is the Veterinarian Teaching Hospital. This was also supported by the General Assembly in the most recent budget to the tune of $73 million of fee replaced bonding authority. We have pledged $30 million in institutional reserves and $5 million in gifts, which the gifts seem to be exceeding expectations, so we'll be supplementing some of those reserves with uh, additional gifts. That's $108 million total for a for a all new veterinarian teaching hospital that'll be 165,000 square feet and consist of an equine hospital, a small animal hospital, as well as a farm animal hospital that's appropriately removed from the others for biosecurity reasons. We have the oldest veterinarian teaching hospital in the country. It was opened in 1959. Uh, much has changed in the way of medicine, both human and animal since then. So we have crammed all this new innovation into space that was never intended to. We have a dental lab and a coat closet. We do uh, MRIs in what used to be a hallway. So we have squeezed every inch of value out of this facility. Uh, it's fully depreciated, as you can imagine. And in fact, it, it is to the point where our accrediting body, the AVMA, uh, has said that you must improve your clinical teaching standards or we cannot accredit you anymore for DVM degrees. So this new hospital will alleviate any accreditation concerns we have and this will be uh, hopefully opening in early 2022 on the south side of the campus and it will be a fully operational 24-7 uh, veterinarian hospital, we would look for a caseload increase, which we see 20,000 cases a year now walk through the door, plus our six ambulances that we operate. I know some on the commission here have personal experience with the hospital, and so uh, I look forward to uh, I look forward to this opening too and serving the people of Indiana. Are you suggesting that someone here? You know, it's a uh, it's very thorough training. So I don't have full faith in DVM. It's a little cheaper, so you can go there. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going to happen to the uh, existing hospital? Well, that's, good. that's a great question because it, it is a large footprint. The large animal space will likely be uh, demolished because it is... Uh, it doesn't have much other good use. There's a lot of wide spaces there, low ceilings. Uh, the other space, what is now small animal and some of the uh, equine area, will be turned into lab and teaching space uh, because the new hospital will allow us the opportunity to consider increasing the size of the vet school as well as the size of the DVM class, which would then require more research space, more teaching space. Any other questions? I can advocate having Cook Research and uh, Cook Biotech, which are both located in West Lafayette, do some work with the veterinary school and in the facilities. And I remember being in it years ago, not 10 plus years ago, and it was in desperate need then. So, uh, and it's even, even more so now. So. As the only Big Ten institution without a medical school, most of our research goes through the College of Veterinary Medicine. And so this is critical for our research enterprise as well. So Alicia, what do you think? <laughs> sounds like a great project. And the other thing that I want to add, um, like Mary Jane was talking about with the IV Tech project, this is another one of the three university projects that the governor proposed cash funding at the close of fiscal year 19. So um, as that gets sorted out, as time goes on, We'll try to keep you updated. Um, yeah, well, as Tony says, we'll figure it out. But just to bring that to your attention. Terrific. 
Good. Is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Congratulations, Tony. Thank you very much. So, Alicia. Yes. So, I, I understand you're going to present on the campus infrastructure infrastructure project at Vincent. Yes, yes. Vincent was unable to make it today. I think they may be on the phone listening right now. And this is one project that was two projects when Vincent originally submitted it in the budget process back in the fall. Um, so it's made up of the campus electrical substation and then a mechanical upgrades uh, project. So the, the current substation no, can no longer support the university's energy demands. And <coughs> you may remember, they've actually had power outages on the campus, which has affected the Vincennes campus, as well as their support services across Indiana and the nation. So that part of the project will replace the existing substation to ensure that VU can meet their their power needs um, and electrical needs well into the future. The second part, as I mentioned, is the mechanical upgrades, which will allow for the replacement of their HVAC systems that have exceeded their uh, life cycle and are unreliable at this point. Um, and so some of the other pieces with the mechanical upgrades is investments into the facilities that include repairing water infiltration issues as well as the installation of new windows and ADA accessibility improvements. So these two together um, total $22.3 million and were cash funded in the most recent budget. So because, because of this, staff recommends approval of the project. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Same side, thank you. Congratulations, Alicia. Thank you. You represented Vincent well. <laughs> we have one capital project for expedited action. IU Med School, South Bend, Harper Hall, lower level research support space and infrastructure. Is there, is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed, same sign. Passed. Um, let's see. Information items, academic degree pro pro programs awaiting action, page 105, academic degree program actions taken by staff, 107, and media coverage, 113. Um, is there any old business? Any new business? Yes. Next, Mr. Chair. Pardon me? Yes, sir. Just a request of you and, and Teresa regarding fields passing. Regarding what? The passing of Phil at, at Vincennes. And I know we recognize his kindness, but is there some form of act that we can take in the future in terms of some type of resolution or something for the record? Just appreciating his service to the state of Indiana on behalf of the commission. That's a very good suggestion. Just something for consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any other new business? Our next meeting is going to be in Vincennes on um, September 12th. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing everyone there. And that will be very appropriate for us to do something while we're at Vincennes. The next meeting is in Jasper. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I, I just stated. Yeah, we're in Vincennes. Jasper camp. Yeah. We'll, we will be in Jasper. We will be in Jasper. Right. I just commend the chairman on getting this done. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was hard. <laughs> oh, wait, how do we gamble out? We are adjourned. <laughs>